The presentation will focus on the implications of the bill for the management of child and adolescent gender dysphoria in New Zealand and its broader regulatory context. We'll start with a case study of a 13 year old girl presenting to an eating disorder clinic. The girl had been sexually abused by her father and had several mental health disorders. She did not initially report a male identity. She was distressed with pubertal development and restricted her eating with the goal of um, suppressing breast growth. The clinicians restored her to a healthy weight. She then began dressing as a boy and claimed a male typical name. She cont continued to be distressed with puberty, hitting her breasts several times per day. She expressed interest in puberty blockers and a referral to a gender clinic was suggested. Was an innate male identity the source of the girl's issues or was it the sexual abuse? Proper assessment must include questioning the basis of her claimed identity. There are three recent media reports of young women in New Zealand who claimed a male identity when younger but no longer do so and have now accepted themselves as female. All three are lesbian. One, Zara Cooper, shown here with her grandfather and her partner, is on the autistic spectrum. Cooper was treated with testosterone, but she believes it contributed to her suicide attempts. In another case reported in the listener this year, the woman was treated with puberty blockers and testosterone as a teenager and underwent a double mastectomy and hysterectomy. The treatment sterilized her. These cases are in line with the population characteristics reported in the literature. All studies that track sexuality report a majority of gender dysphoric adolescents are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Autism and eating disorders are overrepresented, as well as adverse childhood events such as domestic violence, maternal mental illness, bullying, and sexual abuse. In New Zealand, clinics are not regulated, so they do not report these data. However, we do have the Counting Ourselves survey. A third of male identified female respondents report being raped and half report attempted rapes, three times higher than normal. One respondent stated that testosterone treatment reduced the risk of abuse and harassment. Females who take testosterone pass as men, making them less vulnerable to rape from heterosexual men. If dis disproportionate levels of abuse took place prior to the emergence of a male identity, it raises questions on whether direct traumatic experience of female vulnerability is a factor in this population's desire to be male. Uh, professional opinion is highly divided and even acrimonious. The medical bodies on one side highlight the weak evidence base for hormone treatments and may recommend psychotherapy. Other bodies claim that the evidence for medical intervention is sufficient and must proceed without delay. In Australia, the medical intervention side of the debate recommends opposing parents who prefer psychosocial interventions in the courts or reporting them to the authorities for neglect. In New Zealand, the Ministry of Health plays no active role. The de facto regulator is the Professional Association for Transgender Health, Aotearoa, or PATHA. PATHA was established in 2019 with 15 members and is associated with the international group WPATH. Neither, neither PATHA nor WPATH require members to have any qualifications. They are hybrid activist medical organisations. PATHA has written guidelines, then asked the Ministry to link them. The Ministry has agreed, but has never conducted a review or provided oversight. The ministry describes puberty blockers as safe and fully reversible on its website because PATHA has told them that this is the case. The PATHA guidelines claim that there is good evidence for the mental health benefits of puberty blockers, citing a single study. Doctors are advised to refer promptly for puberty suppression. The guidelines state that this advice should not vary even for severely autistic young people. UK health authorities have a markedly different view of the evidence. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, is the UK authority for clinical guidelines and one of the most well-respected medical authorities of this kind in the world. According to NICE, there is little, if any, evidence for mental health improvements with blockers. The Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford has a similar assessment. The centre describes hormone treatments as an unregulated live experiment on children and highlights how puberty blockers are likely to threaten adolescent brain development. This risk to brain development is not mentioned in the exemplar consent forms provided with PATHA guidelines. Closer to home, the Royal Australia New Zealand College of Psychiatrists agree with NICE's assessment in a statement made last month. 
Another psychiatrist body in Australia also describes puberty blockers as experimental and recommends psychosocial interventions as the first line of treatment. The PATHA claims and recommendations cannot be reconciled with these statements. Which side has got it right? The hybrid activist medical organization established two years ago or independent assessments by highly regarded medical authorities. The split in opinion is now happening in WPATH. Three senior members were interviewed, um, revealing, interviewed and released revealing statements last week. The president-elect of WPATH, Dr. Bowers, stated that kids treated with blockers in early puberty will have compromised sexual function and fertility in later life and questions their capacity to consent. Another WPATH board member, Dr. Anderson, was asked if the psychological effects of puberty blockers were reversible and responded, I'm not sure. Dr. Anderson believes that more young people will realize medical treatments did not provide the solution. Alongside the two mentioned, a third senior WPATH member, Dr. Edward Sleeper, also believes social influence, not innate, not innate gender identity, is playing a role in the increased, increased numbers of young people seeking treatment. Given all these recent revelations, it would be useful if PATHA president and fellow WPATH board member, Dr. Jamie Veal, could confirm if PATHA stands by the claims of good evidence and advice to refer properly for puberty blockers. We recommend that the Justice Committee confirm the status of current de facto regulations before passing a more law that has implications in this area. Once the bill becomes law, it will be easy for activists to cast the psychotherapeutic approach as akin to conversion practice. Activist linked literature explicitly describes the approach in this way. Even with zero prosecutions, mental health professionals will avoid offering psychotherapy for this population if it comes with the risk of a career ending accusations of career conversion practice. Is it the intention of Parliament to ban the psychotherapeutic approach and are MPs even aware of the controversies? If it is not the intention of Parliament, then you must make absolutely clear that psychotherapy that explores the trauma influenced background to gender dysphoria remains lawful. Parents who receive a recommendation to treat their child with blockers will of course look up further information. When parents discover that several notable health authorities have conflicting view to that of the Ministry of Health, this will only serve to diminish public trust. We should strive to maintain public trust in the ministry for obvious reasons. Therefore, the statement should be removed. When medical professionals cannot agree on treatment regimes, the proper role of the regulator is to investigate and determine a path forward. Three countries have conducted or have ongoing reviews. All three have shifted away from hormone treatments towards psychotherapy. Fourth and final, it must remain lawful beyond doubt for a parent or caregiver to question the basis of their child's opposite sex identification. If a parent believes the past, that past trauma or homosexual status is influencing their child's gender confusion and distress, then just stating this is responsible parenting, not illegal behavior. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You actually have um, a couple of minutes to go. Yeah. Have you got anything you wanted to add to that presentation? And I'm just looking around. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, we have um, Dr. Elizabeth Kedikedi. We're, we're quite lucky, Simon. Uh, we've got uh, one of the international experts um, here with us. So, uh, Elizabeth, off you go. Just a quick question. Kia ora. Thank you, Kia Simon, ora. for your presentation. Are you suggesting that puberty blockers, which have been available for decades in New Zealand, have not been cleared by Pharmac or MedSafe? That a community group somehow has the power to give medicines for our, med our health system to distribute? That's a, good, that's a very good question. Uh, so the use, for, the use for puberty suppression is off-label. Uh, that means that um, clinicians have the um, clinicians have the leeway to do what they want as long as they as long as they uh, seek to get informed consent. So Pharmac haven't specifically approved them for this use. They've, they've approved them for things like prostate cancer, uh, and and the, the the drugs have other uses. So they've been approved for those uses, uh, but there has been no. Uh, Pharmac, nor the Ministry of Health, nor, nor any medical authority in New Zealand has specifically looked at the use for, uh, for puberty suppression of adolescents specifically. Um, and does that answer the question? 
Yes, and I think we are at time. So thank you, Simon, for your contribution.